Good evening with you, of and welcome to the KSH Architecture uh, Public Program for this evening. Uh, my name is Björn Ademark. And tonight we have a lecture in a series that we call New School. Uh, since the KSH School of Architecture was founded a really long time ago, in 1877, we are by definition old school. But um, we're also new and young in the sense that we're in this uh, brand new envelope or package that we're still trying to figure out how to inhabit. And that's why uh, in this series we invite uh, people representing institutions of uh, architectural knowledge production and teaching and learning that are founded uh, very recently uh, to present their pedagogy and their methods and uh, how they uh, think about uh, these things, how to uh, learn and teach architecture and spatial knowledge and spatial practice in general. Uh, and this uh, more broader sense of uh, spatial practice is something that we'll talk about tonight uh, when Christina Banner from the Institute of the Realm Experimenter uh, will talk about that institution, that program. Uh, she co-founded the Institute of the Realm Experiment at the University of Parks in uh, Berlin, in UDK, uh, together with Eric Ellingsen and Olaf Redieson, whose exhibition at Madame Museum is open for few more days, uh, and this weekend, if you're interested to see it, or see it again after uh, this lecture. Uh, Christina has a background in cultural studies and critical studies, uh, and yeah, was part of this experiment since it started. So, I'm really happy to Thank you very much. So I'm very happy that I am invited to uh, talk a little bit about the Institute of Raum Experiment, which was founded in that by Olaf Reliason. And first of all, I want to thank uh, the school here and um, Anna Sihansen and Jan for the invitation, because it's rather rare that um, an architecture school invites an art school to present their program or their pedagogy. Or maybe it's not unusual here, but um, I think it's very nice to have this cross-disciplinary invitation. So thank you very much. Also, in the context of this uh, series, New Schools. So I think that's very interesting for us to be part of this series. Um, as the title of the Institute half suggests, the translation is Institute for Spatial Experiments, we might have a lot of questions in common, but also since we were clearly an art school, we might be a little bit the odd one that's out here. So, but that's up to you to decide maybe afterwards. So I start with a couple of facts. The Institute for Raumexperimente is an entirely public school. It's an experimental model in art education. And we were supposed from the beginning to be a five-year model. So we operated from 2009 to 2014. And Olafur always said, I do it for five years and then we close it. Because if we run it longer, we'll have to institutionalize and we're no longer a model. So then we would change our rhetorics and the reality would be different. So it's clear that in 2014, we stopped the program. Uh, the school was financed by the Senate Department uh, of Education, Youth and Science of the State of Berlin and the second part by the Einstein Foundation in Berlin and all of this is basically taxpayers' money. So it was a public program in that sense and it was important for all of them to say it's not an avant-garde school model in the classical sense so he was not trying to really distance himself from the classical, traditional, state-organized um, education system. 
and it was also not a private career-oriented educational scheme. So we were independent in running the program. The UDK had nothing to do with how we operated the program. But at the same time, we were clearly a satellite of the Berlin University of the Arts uh, as part of the faculty of the finance department. And all the exams or how you enter into the system and of course also the whole accounting was the same as in any other master or professor class that you have. So this is where we were. The first very obvious difference to running a professor class at the Ulika in the regular sense was that we were not on campus, not on site. So Olafur decided um, when he was in negotiation with the art school about how he could actually do this professorship to invite the students to be part of his studio. So he knew that he would move into a new space in Berlin Mitte, which is the image on top. It's an old brewery and he knew he would move his studio in there and the whole second floor, well, ground floor, first floor, were um, studio spaces and the basement was also workshops and the, the top floor was empty and he decided that this could become the school. So as you see, when we moved in it was completely empty and the whole space was up for transformation and we could decide together with the students how to use it. So the change the, the room used and how we, uh, how we furnished it or how it was compartmentalized was really up to everyone involved in the course. In the beginning, it still looked very clean and very organized, as you see on the right side. And then very fast, it became really an art school with all the materials and all the crowdedness and all the messiness that is part of that. So in that space, we managed to move in um, small studio spaces for each of the participants. It was around 30 per semester who had really working and desk spaces there, like garage-sized spots, I can say. And then we had a communal area in the same space uh, for the teaching or the collective activities. And that also changed every year. The, the group of students who were interested could suggest how to organize that space to how to build it and to come up with a design and then it would be realized and used. Um, to understand a little bit the studio and school uh, constellation, so in order for studio when we started the school there were about 70 people who worked there. Everything from carpenter to architects, art historians, people who do press and uh, archiving, so a very big team, and then on top we were there with 30 participants, around 30 participants in number group, and a lot of invited guests. So I would say on a regular day there were 100 people crossing through the house, and we were really trying to make it beneficial for both sides that the knowledge that was produced in the school and the knowledge that exists in the studio with all those different types of experts would benefit both ways. In the beginning, we profited more from the studio knowledge, but then once we were up and running, it would go both ways. And the studio was invited, if they could, because they had you know, nine to five jobs, join the school, which only happened on special occasions just because of the working pressure or structure. But on a general invitation, they could join all the lectures. And the participants in the school were always invited to ask questions to the experts down in the studio and the workshops. And what was really important was the kitchen. So we had lunches together for coffee breaks, and that's when you actually have a chance to also make friendships or to ask people, how do I work this? I have this plan, could you show me? It takes a little bit of time to develop these relationships and we are trying to also uh, support this with some other structures, but the lunch and the food was really important. Um, I don't know how many of you have been at the Moderna Museum because there is a film, uh, the Google Microscope, that shows a bit of the studio. So I brought a little excerpt of that film which will show you the studio spaces inside, just to understand where the whole thing is located.
what you see in the back is actually the kitchen, and then the long tables where, where everyone is meeting for lunch. Slow motion experts in the film are all from the team from Steven Kerner. He's a dancer and choreographer and trainer uh, from Denmark and an old friend of Oxford. So he was invited to the studio and to the school first on several occasions. And um, here he brought his team of uh, dancers uh, to do this film in the studio. And as you can see, there's already only on this floor a lot of different people working on a lot of different things. Co-production and shared knowledge and uh, also artistic research is, has always been part of the studio structure. And um, so it came really natural for Olaf to put this into teaching or to, to put this up into the school. The studio also had a lot of um, training in how to run symposiums because each year he would uh, invite or organize for his studio team what they call life in space or life in space uh, a one day very dense symposium where people who were researching or were experts on topics they were researching at the moment were invited and the whole studio with those invited guests would uh, work on different topics. So that was one model that was already exercised before the school actually started. For the school, with our participants upstairs, it was also important to have a sort of demystification of what an artist studio is. So we were trying out several formats on how to go down to the studio without always only talking about workers' practice, but about practice that would be relevant for the project of the student at that time, and also to showcase problems or questions that Olaf work would have with projects. So it was really also about demystification and about knowledge transfer and exchange. And one other reason why Olaf said I want to have the school as part of inside the studio was that he was um, not so interested in the sealed of environment of an art university, which somehow I don't know, it might be different in an architecture school because you might choose different topics. But at the Lika in Berlin, you're normally assigned to one artist, so you have this master, professor, student, young artist relationship. And Oliver found that very unproductive, maybe also because out of his own experience during art school. So from the very beginning, he said, I want to run a school that has a multiplicity of voices. So that the first way that this is represented was that he chose to have two co-directors. So uh, like Bjorn said, Eric Williamson, my colleague, he comes from the US. He was in Chicago before running an art experimental architecture program there. And he has a background in literature and landscape architecture. And I come with a different background in curation and cultural studies. And then Olaf Poy is an artist and he has always worked cross-disciplinary. So there was already a very different mix of approaches in how we would set out the program. And then the other thing is that he said we really want to invite a lot of different people um, to share their knowledge with us. And that means throughout the five years of experimentation, there were 400 people that um, came to work with us in different capacities for really being invited to contribute to the program. And we had, for example, non-violent communication experts there. It was uh, two women from Switzerland who did a fantastic workshop. And we had a lot of fun talking and exercising non-violent communication.
conversation with Sie. Can I really speak closer to the microphone? Oh, yes, thank you for telling me. See, this is very good because I'm actually not used to microphone situations because we had rather smaller units when we talk. Thank you. So, nonviolent communication experts, we had vegan cooks, composers, lawyers. Um, one of the lawyers actually was a brand in the school. He, he had his office in one of our small uh, secu sec secluded office spaces. Philosophers, social scientists, astrophysicists, that was actually the third or fifth lecture we had. Architects, poets, we did a lot of poetry um, collaborations with poets from Ethiopia. In a core and slack lining specialist, we'll see that later, choreographers, artists, a dear imitator, uh, a kung fu master, we took kung fu lessons, and a politician, he was also actually a grant, and that was a project of Olafur's in the context of the Berlin Biennial. So he was with us for half a year, he took, I don't know, you, I would want to say a paternity leave to actually come to study with us in the art school. And many more. So this is a, what the institute looked like on a uh, full day. So we had a lot of different formats, of course, from one-to-one -one critiques to very small uh, project groups and workshops. And then we had these very dense days and symposium formats, normally three days, and we called them marathons because it was 30 to 40 to 50 invited contributors and then invited also other art schools or other students or other collaborators from different institutions to take part in those. So we had a curatorial marathon on the left. The right was an experiment in an artist marathon where young artists from Berlin uh, presented their practice uh, on the left. Uh, is, uh, it was actually a martial art exercise as part of the performance marathon and then as part of the space activism marathon we had slackliners in the lunch break. And then um, I mentioned that before, on the top right, this is my colleague Eric Ellingson in a costume that is inspired by Schlemmer, Oskar Schlemmer's um, costumes for the uh, Geometrus Ballet from Bauhaus, and he was uh, doing his lecture in the costume, uh, doing what he was talking about at the same time, and I think it was very exhausting for him. Then we had a visit to the silent chamber, an unechoic chamber as part of a sound study workshop, um, and another guided tour with an artist collective from the main in public space. And here on the top left is Stanford Quinter in Princessian Garden, which is a collective garden neighborhood initiative in Berlin that we visited dancers from uh, a choreographer in Berlin during the performance marathon. Again, slack liners, and then you see uh, what I mentioned before, one of the dinners uh, lunch uh, in the studio during one of the marathons. So <clears throat> those marathons became really important for us because it was also about doing too much in a very short time that then had to be digested throughout the semester. So it was centered around a topic that had to do with interests that a majority of the students might have, or that we said is really important um, to do. And the first day of those um, symposiums were always days where we took people out into the city, because it was always important to connect back to the context of Berlin, either the street or the institutions, or uh, whatever else we would define as context. And for example, on the space um, activism marathon, we would be intercepted by groups that uh, move through space, seeing surfaces as possibilities for engagement. So we had um, biking, slacklining, skating, parkouring, street dance, or climbing, uh, like you see in the uh, left low image. And we would also talk about their 
understanding of surfaces in space. Um, we would have different food practices outdoors um, engaged, and we would have experts on urbanism uh, with us and discuss history of squatting, for example, which for us was just a detail also interesting because uh, during the early days of squatting in Berlin, they used art as a legal method to not be kicked out by the police. So details like this, they would say, oh, we're not squatting, we're doing actually an art project here, and there was no reason to kick them out. So they really had lawyers who used that type of argument against the police. And we would also have graffiti experts. Um, I choose this list not as a name-dropping example, but just because I thought since it has to do with space, you might recognize some of the names, whereas maybe not from some of the other marathons. So just to see the mix of people who were there on those three days, from Vitor Conchi, who <laughs> says he is now an architect. His practice is now architecture, although we still think of him as an artist. And then artists like Monica Bonvicini, of course, would have said something, and then different urban and architectural companies and um, projects, and uh, Thomas Saraceno of up and coming, not so young anymore, but uh, not so already has been coming. I'm not to say it's already quite out there. So uh, a very interesting mix of people that were all discussing how they work with space and in space or what their conception of space. Um, so the institute is in itself an experiment and we took that very serious which means that also everyone who was invited as well as Olaf, Eric and myself were also guinea pigs in that whole undertaking. So how we would do things, how we would structure it, why we would structure it this way it had to be reinvented each time because we had no history like for example this school has in that sense. So sometimes we felt like protagonists of a making of film together with all the participants in the course actually. And a lot of um, the, a lot of inspiration from choosing this approach also comes from a book from Jacques Poncier, uh, The Ignorant Schoolmaster, where it is also about how can you teach on equal terms. This is not always possible in such a structure where you invite people who have already a history or a experience in teaching. But it was also a challenge for us to invite people who are used to lecture style or to a certain way of doing things in teaching and to invite them to say, would you take a risk with, with us to do something different? So this creating a ground for a situation where they would also trust us to do something where they don't know what exactly the situation would be or how it would be in the end was also part of this experimentation so that it was not only for the students and participants but actually really for everyone. And a lot of um, the how and whys I also call was a way of um, curating communication and I think that's also a question that architects know a lot about because how you arrange a situation for people to meet and to actually interact has a lot to do with things that you also learn here. Um, another thing that has to do with this um, approach was that we were trying to teach from the student. That means we were trying to structure the program from what we thought is what they want. <laughs> sometimes they said it, sometimes we had to guess. But you, they present their projects or their artistic ideas and then you see, oh, maybe we should invite this and this person because there's a group of students who's actually interested in this and that topic. So that was also um, a way of trying to teach on their behalf and not on their expense. And um, as Olafur says, a lot of those um, text quotes are actually from Olafur's statement that's also on the website, a school statement. So he also says, uh, the experiment as a mode of inquiry is necessary if we are to insist on a constant probing and generous interaction with reality. And this very much also comes from his artistic approach, but it was also very much of the school's 
uh, way of operating. And uh, I brought another small film clip that um, where you can hear Olafur actually talking about the school and about the marathons. And it's uh, done by Natasha Mendoka, who also had a grant at the school and is a young filmmaker, uh, now again based in India. aspect and uh, an interaction in or with public space. So for the mirror walk that you just saw, you use a mirror to orient yourself um, looking into the mirror, into the reflected space and we also tried it out uh, by combining two or three people so you try to orient yourself through the mirror of the other person. And it sounds very simple and it is very simple, um, but it also uh, makes you aware of a lot of things that you tend to forget, how you orient, what surfaces you're surrounded by, details that you otherwise won't see. You think again about perspectival views, three-dimensional perception, your body awareness, um, or rather your unawareness, because you normally don't think how you walk or how you move, and then you again realize how you shift balance and things. So also your peripheral vision um, and surround sounds. So there's also how long it takes you to get somewhere once you don't walk 
in the regular way. So these experiments really had to do a lot with situating your body and your perception. Um, and if you don't mind, before I let Oliver talk about one of his examples again, I would like to suggest a very, very small one-minute experiment with you, and I won't ask you afterwards what it's for or how you felt or whatever, but it might help to connect to the next small clip where Olafur is doing something. So I would like to suggest that we all close our eyes for exactly one minute. So you don't know how long the minute is until you think it's over and you open your eyes again. However you do it, if you count or if you breathe or if you think of the way you move from your hometown uh, house to the bus stop, which might be a minute or whatever, is totally up to you and we all do it at the same time and I just tell you when to close your eyes and then you open it again in one minute which is now. So it's two minutes and 15 now. I don't know if I interrupted someone at that point. I think I saw everyone opening their eyes again. Um, and I uh, don't need to comment on it, but I instead I will let Oliver talk about an uh, experiment in public space that he did in a park uh, in Reinhardt's, Reinhardtstraße in Berlin. This is, I think, an easy exercise to do outside as well. This is me rehearsing my slow motion walk. As you can see, this woman walks normally five, that is correct. And I'm trying to do it relatively slow. The so-called public space, this is the park in Reinhardtstrasse, around a few blocks from here. Uh, the, the, the sort of obvious making things slow, I think, is one thing. The other thing that I think contextually with regards to looking at slow motion, maybe as a, as, as a, how should I say this, but we talked about storing, storing the experiences and how that produces the surroundings. So one could argue that the woman walking by me, she felt relatively fast compared to me. So I didn't maybe not slow down as much as we did. As it looks, maybe she actually speeded up. Not only did she speak of relatively speaking to me and how I moved, but she also speeded up with regards to the amount of unpredictable matter that I added to the space. As she said to herself, maybe 
I don't feel comfortable in a park with a person walking very slow. I've got to speed up and I'm going to be less attentive should have he behaved normally. There's a, there's a sort of, there's a sort of um, reorganization of a few things, not just temporary issues, also the fact that this woman are suddenly presented with, uh, with something that is not, is not a major conflict, but it is um, a frictional phenomenon, and she, to some extent, takes a more firm grip of her back. There was another person before that with a dog, and the dog behaved very aggressively, a very small dog. And as I believe the dogs, not always, but often, are, of course, a sort of psychograph, of psychographic image of the <laughs> so nevertheless, so the dog kind of attacks me, right? And they were, the person is sort of also afraid, and, and so on and so forth. So I'm just saying, with regards to slowness, it's not just exposing the speed or the relative speed of others, it also exposes a number of uh, other issues, which of course is related to the fact that public space, as we know, is, is entangled in a lot of other uh, rules and structures and power structures and systems of... of um, those uh, hold great potential, as we all know. And I, I, thought, I just think, in order to... I started doing slow motion because somebody showed it to me. And of course, this person was very good at it. And you would actually see him say it. But I made it a rule always to show it when I talk about it. Because I think it has particular quality, especially if you look at it together as we discussed. So I'll just do a very slow motion, a brief slow motion walk. Would you talk closer to the mic again, oh, thanks, please? thanks. Yeah, please keep reminding <laughs> me. <laughs> so, um, one of the examples that took this um, notion of everyone is a participant or a practitioner very serious was a project um, that was called Translation Acts uh, in the frame of a larger uh, festival that was called The World is Not Fair, the große Weltausstellung 2012, and uh, it was um, organized by uh, Architecture Collective in Berlin called Raumlabor uh, Berlin and uh, Hebel am Ufer uh, under uh, Matthias Lilienthal and they had invited a lot of different groups and set up different pavilions on the Tempelhof in field the former um, airport and we were one of the groups and that meant that we um, transferred for four weeks the whole program of the institute to this former balloon hall uh, and opened it up to everyone who would be a passerby or a festival visitor or friends of friends or just um, yeah public that was on site and <coughs> everyone all the participants were invited to contribute to the program so we had artworks performances uh, interventions readings lectures uh, all different formats and everyone could suggest something and we also organized uh, another program around that. 
So everyone was contributing to those public four weeks. As you see, we had film programs running. The whole architecture was actually um, planned and built with a group of our participants, with uh, uh, architect uh, exist, uh, Alexander Römer. So they built this agora, and all of the segments could be transferred to desks or other seating facility, uh, facilities, indoor and outdoor, and used for smaller groups or for bigger groups again. And um, the large round table discussion down there was uh, again a collaboration with the Berlin Biennial, where actually Olaf with invited guests. Uh, guests talked about um, public space. Um, and then uh, something that connects to how we did this project and to other things is another um, quote from the statement. The most important thing was for the participant to gain confidence in what they do. Having confidence and believing that most everything is possible is a powerful driving force. So the encouragement is not just a theoretical one, it was also a very practical one. So this is one example of an intervention by two of our participants and artists, um, Fabian Klemp and Andreas Kreiner. They organized and managed uh, to have this explosion happening on the infield. They worked together with a pyrotechnician and everything was planned well and no one was hurt and everything was organized and allowed and blah blah blah. So they managed to go through this whole process of um, making that happen. And actually what you see now is a very well organized photo taken from afar. The whole explosion was also only visible for a couple of seconds and then you would see small clouds um, disappear. And they um, also experimented or tested the rumors and the media attention and how those images circulate in the public space of the media. So there was another um, small example how some of those programmed and um, yeah, how the contributions from the participants actually were out. Um, the Tempelhof uh, four weeks were also a test run for another bigger project that we were already um, planning, which was bringing the whole institute, all our 30 participants, plus also invited guests, to Addis Abeba in Ethiopia. It was a collaboration with the Alice School of Fine Arts and Design at the Addis Abeba University. It's a rather small compound. They have 100 plus students. So for us coming with 30 was quite a big group um, that all of a sudden uh, took part in the campus life there. And this was uh, one uh, larger collaboration. We had other uh, academic uh, collaborations also with um, the ETH Zurich, with the landscape class from um, Günther Vogt, Professor Günther Vogt. And we had a collaboration with the class of uh, Bruno Latour at Science Po in Paris, uh, who had just started a new master of experimentation on art and politics, and also with the graduate uh, Harvard Graduate School of Design at GSD in uh, Cambridge with uh, Sandra Quinter, whom you saw in one of the um, photos earlier. And then we said, okay, if we're doing a collaboration in Addis Abeba, we need to go for a longer period because it's a context that we cannot make ourselves familiar in a very short period. So we decided to take the whole institute there for 10 weeks. So it filled basically one one semester, not quite because we were back at Christmas, but it felt like one semester. And it was, again, also taking serious experimentation. So the questions that we had to answer, or try to answer for ourselves and everyone who was involved was, what is possible? How can you work as a group in a context of Addis Abeba? And how can you do what you do here in Berlin? Uh, as part of your practice there, because we said we don't do something special or else. Going there and doing what we do in a completely different context is already um, what we do. Then how do we engage through our artistic practice and how do we find a language that speaks to and in another context? And um, because it's a bit hard to imagine <coughs> without having 
seen anything before. I just show a couple of images. So on the right you see traditional housing structure, um, how it was, and on the left you see that the city is in transformation, in constant transformation, and they build now a lot of new high-rise buildings, and what you see is what you see right now, but what they actually want to be, or what their wishful thinking or vision is, is Dubai. So they want the city to actually build everyone, of course, but um, Dubai is the big, um, yeah, the big brother. Uh, Addis Abeba is the capital of, Addis, uh, of uh, Ethiopia with four million people and uh, on the left you see that a lot is still traditional um, structures with no electricity, uh, with black water systems uh, and those corrugated roofs and on the right you see how the structure changes, you still have like the uh, one floor uh, type of buildings, but then they start to build new high rises. Hope they wish for until the horizon, I guess. And then you see the quarters, the traditional quarters on top that are called kebeles, demolished. So really, a lot of those areas that have a very um, functioning social structure and neighborhood structure are actually just torn down and the people are replaced and the system works and doesn't work. So there's a lot of things to say about that. The ETH has a project at the architecture school there and I think if anyone of you is interested in going to Addis Abeba on an on a urban scale, it's a very exciting time to go there. Uh, the right image uh, on the bottom is at Mercato. They have one of the biggest uh, outdoor retail markets and the colorful sheets of, of fabric you see is what it looked before and also there they're trying to build a lot of new uh, yeah, buildings for the, for the market and at the moment they only use the ground floors and then the upper floors are storage because it's not really in the structure of how it's been used so far, but I think this will also transform. So there's a lot of transformation, it's very fast. The Chinese just built a very uh, large um, high line uh, tra city train cutting through the whole city. And um, so, so that's the context in which we arrived. And at the art school, it was again uh, they were offering us actually again a top floor space, very nice, with nothing. So we came and we had to build uh, our furniture before we started. And then the program was uh, hosted the same way it was hosted in Berlin. It was open to the whole uh, students of the school there, to our participants, but also to uh, a lot of artists in town who were interested in coming by. But we also had sessions where we would. Um, just do smaller group uh, work and project reviews and then we also invited guests like we did in Berlin, so for example Molly Nesbitt was there, an art historian, Chantal Mouf who is a political uh, theorist and Elvira Use who is a um, curator who at that time worked for an African collection in London. And then this is a, a project that was done by two of our brands, Paul Weich and Kotini, Natsvedua together with uh, an Ethiopian architect. And these are actually guard houses. So they carry these guard houses and put them in front of whatever building and the guard sleeps in that during nighttime, also sits there during daytime. And they carried it through the city, one time using it as a mobile gallery for artworks, and the second time they asked people um, what would you guard, or what is worth guarding? And we carried it to different places, and everything was fine. We had a lot of very interesting discussions with people there. And then we ended in a very dense public area around Alakilo, and we drew too much attention. Um, we had a big crowd of people around us, and that, of course, caught the police attention. And uh, they said, we have to come and we were questioned, so we sent away all the most opinionated <laughs> participants of ours. 
and uh, yeah, I went with a small group and uh, really had to report to the secret police inside the police station. Uh, I had to delete photos and um, everything was fine in the end, but it was a weird two hours, but we knew that this could happen. Um, and it's just, I don't tell that as an anecdote of, uh, of what we did, but also to say how different the notion of security in public space or how they police their things they have to protect the public works. So at the end of this interrogation, the secret police person apologized and that he doesn't want us to report a negative image of Ethiopia when we go home. They just have a different job of um, securing public space. So there was a lot of different um, notions and a lot of um, questions <laughs> that came up with this, but it was a very uh, interesting uh, project in the end. And this is another project that was uh, part of the Addis Photo Fest, uh, a festival that we participated in. And this was uh, also a mm. photo project where, which was called um, City Portrait, where the idea was to actually portray the city in the background because people go and get their photos taken in photo studios uh, on holidays and uh, dressed up. And we said, let's offer a possibility to get photographed in every day, but by doing this also to portray the city before it's completely changed. So we went to a lot of uh, traditional housing areas and uh, Kebeles and the people could then go to another local photo shop in the neighborhood and get their photos from there. This is at Mercato, another project by two of our artists, um, which has to do again with how do we perceive space. <laughs> and then this was um, our final project, which happened with a lot of uh, collaborative uh, efforts. We organized a large festival on the former horse track field, uh, where everyone who was interested could participate. It was announced through the radio, which is a bit big, uh, which is better than newspaper or any other medium to advertise events. And this is how it looked like. So we had small pavilions, performances, uh, sculptures, the taxi drivers that drove a lot of our participants across town uh, participated and you see the smoke, the exhaust in this cube because there's a lot of uh, smoke issues going on. Um, the, the one below is actually tracing uh, a demolished mm -hmm. quarter and re yeah, and doing it in real size on the field. And here you see that uh, a lot of uh, locals participated as well. And um, I think there's a lot. You, you tell me when we get too close to the end. Um, Um, so this notion of the festival is not just because we want to celebrate art, what we also want to do, of course, but also because it allows for a lot of different ways of um, participation from visitors or from different audiences. So uh, another three-day festival that we were able to organize happened in 2014 at the Neue National Gallery in Berlin, the Mies van der Rohe building before it's been renovated. So this was one of the very, la the last one was Kraftwerk inside it, but we were the second last um, event that happened there. And we were invited to um, participate inside an installation by David Chipperfield, who will actually renovate and refurbish the building. And David Chipperfield had planted or built in an installation called Sticks and Stones which is um, uh, originally grown trees that are installed like a forest, also with a clearing in the middle, uh, in the structure 
of the building, uh, you see the, the crossing points uh, in the roof. So it was a very regular grid of trees inside the upper hall of the Mies van der Rohe building, and we were invited to use it whatever way we wanted, and you see it became a very um, dense festival with a lot of uh, people joining day and night, and um, a lot of like 100 artists and participants from our program uh, offered works and uh, performances and, and interaction with the audience. So this was the opening night with Olafur and Uwe Kittelmann and um, Martin Renner from the, the president from the UDK. And as you see, it also became really a, a party. Then we had um, more spatial experiments again with an installation that everyone who wanted could start to participate in and continue. And at some point, the tension of this structure became so high that it then collapsed, which was a very nice moment of suspense. We had segway performances as well, and uh, music. Uh, Robert Lipok is a musician and one of our former friends. So uh, this leads me to another part of the, the statement. So each participant had to find his or, or her own Umsetzung, it's a German word for, there's not a real translation, um, explicitation or for realization, uh, a way of implementing artistic ideas. Therefore, our main approach was to teach from the participants' desires. This is why we derived the topics of our shared learning from the individual projects rather than instigating on archive uh, or archival themes. The curriculum was written at the end of each semester, if at all. So that's very true. Of course, we had a lot of uh, things like the bigger events that needed planning ahead. But then there was a lot of from one week to the next or from two weeks to the next. So we could really respond to projects the artists in the school would want to develop or were about to develop. Or we could see who is a guest in the studio and invite them to come up and do something with us. So there was a red thread, but only in retrospect. <coughs> so these are a couple of more images from uh, participants' projects in public space. This is from Paul Wald and one of the uh, works through Berlin. And then Norgard Kröger did a money test in Lisbon, where she put uh, one euro coins in public space and we experienced what happens in the beginning. I don't know, it might be different in every other city, but in the beginning people were adding money to it, like uh, in, in fountains where you say, oh, I'm, I'm returning, I add a coin. So people were adding coins, but it, then at some point there was two guys who were coming and really grabbing everything they could, putting the, it into plastic bags and the bags was so heavy that once they wanted to run away, the bags crash and everything went back to the floor again. <laughs> it could have been different, but that was what actually happened in the end. Then um, in the left image on the, uh, on the bottom, uh, Thomas Espinosa, um, this was when we were in China. We did a lot of group trips that were always connected to projects, beat exhibitions or other things. So in this case, Thomas was in a local <laughs> market where they sell clothes, but also vegetables and animals and I don't know what. And he was offering um, his cucumbers they were made from clay. And he offered them for people to touch. And of course, we didn't speak the language, so there was a lot of, um, a lot of uh, openness. <laughs> it was a very interesting uh, situation as well. And then we had a street poem in uh, Zagreb, Croatia. Then Norgard writing in Chinese on the um, on the public square there, at the Tiananmen Square. Um, you can't eat money, spelling it out with money. And uh, Julien Chalier did a test uh, with squares uh, by pigeons. And a lot of different projects derived from this first test of working with patients in public space. Yeah, 
I skip this one. <laughs> Here you see a couple of more exhibitions, uh, a poster project that we presented in Japan. Then we did an exhibition in our space at the Institute. These are the other three images with uh, musicians playing from the roof and actually the ambulance is also an artwork by one of our artists, Fabian Knecht, who works a lot with confusing what is art and what is real life. And then um, images again from an exhibition in uh, Guangzhou at uh, Vitamin Creative Space, where we collaborated on an exhibition and part of the exhibition took place as a guided walk in public space through the market area that you saw before and ended on the rooftop. Yeah. And um, let me check the time. I think I'll skip through this and mention it in a second. This is just one example because we are asked a lot um, how the students do after graduation, so how do the artists uh, are once they leave. And a lot of them do very well, so this is just two examples from recent exhibitions from two of them. And then um, before I mention the publications, I would like to invite you all to go to first lecture because the exhibition is closing after the weekend and I think the 16th is Saturday, right? Saturday there is a symposium and conference at the Moderna Museum and he uh, will be there and speak with him, Leopold, and if you're interested in that thematic, you're very welcome to go there. Um, yeah. So uh, the only thing left to mention is that um, as part of the program we did a lot of publication experiments as well. So the publications we did were always also pedagogical experiments using projects, working with the participants to come up with different solutions. And one that might be interesting here is this one, and you can come up and I can also talk about it later. It was uh, our collaboration with um, the landscape architecture class at ETH, so we had architects and artists working together for a summer semester in, both in Zurich and in Berlin. So we had a shared reader. Uh, the seminar was called Mapping Everything, so a lot of very different approaches of how you could think and do mapping. And then uh, the publication is an experiment of trying to show how you could set up such a collaboration. So we have uh, a part that's chronologically showing a little bit of the experiments, the curriculum, the things we did with um, transcripts of some of the talks and a film list and so on and so forth. And then the whole project ended with um, interventions in public space in Berlin Tiergarten and around that area of the main building of the university. And each of those projects is represented as a page in the publication and the back connects to a number at the back of this. So if you are more interested in the projects, you can also look at the cards and think, oh, I'm interested in that project, what is the number in the title? And then you can find it, and then you find more information in the publication again. So the whole idea of mapping goes through the whole publication as well. Just very briefly to say, this is maybe something that is very close to your all um, practice. And then there's a couple of other insti uh, institute publications here I can, if anyone is interested, uh, later talk about. This is images, it's an image essay of five years of Institute for Rome experiment and the title is How to Make and Now the Best Art School in the World. <laughs> so if you want to look at this, you're very welcome. And uh, if you have any questions, you're also welcome. And otherwise, if you have questions, just one-to-one, -one, we can also wrap it up and 
make it more informal, as you wish. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. Um, I, I, I'm um, interested to, to sort of break down the actual name of the school, the program, the project. So, so the, the question is simple, but maybe it's not simple to answer. What, I mean, what, what, uh, when naming it, what, what did you think? Um, Sort of what was your definition of space and why was it in name? And the same thing with experiment and with uh, institute. What is, what, why, why this uh, name, the uh, Institute for Spatial Experiment? Okay, one. Um, the, at the UDKI, at the Berlin University of the Arts, there's like a professor for painting, a professor for sculpture, a professor for. Mm -hmm. So Olaf's professorship was originally a sculpture, sculpture, three, yeah, a sculpture professorship. So trying to not stick to the traditional idea of sculpture, we were trying to broaden it. And then there's uh, the idea of Institut für Raumexperiment came up very early, but of course we had a lot of different mm -hmm. other ideas, so I always say we are also a Raum für Institutsexperimente, we could say, <laughs> and Oliver kept telling the president of the uh, UDK when he asked how we came up with the topic that he had someone with a pendulum who would uh, find out which is the best name for us, which is actually not true. But So there's, there's a lot of reasons, and I think um, the best way to actually understand it is to browse through the program where you see a lot of different notions of space and that space and time is always connected and for everyone who is a spatial practitioner I would recommend also to um, look at Doreen Messing. She wrote a book for space and she has a lecture on our website where she explained the main ideas in a very nice pedagogic way. Um, so I would recommend also to look at that for an answer. Her name again? Doreen Messi. Thank you. Uh, any questions from anybody else in the room? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Um, I'm very struck by aspects of the pedagogical approach that you're describing here and especially the assertions um, that you rep represent with respect to Oliver Eliasson's desire to perhaps undo the hierarchies of a, of a studio, of both a studio and also a pedagogical studio context. Um, but uh, you, you can see the challenges he's facing because despite his desire, he's a very um, powerful personality. And uh, in, in 2007, I was at one of the Life in Space exhibitions or events, yeah. and um, you could see how everything constellated around him. So I was just wondering about those tensions of the desire on the one hand to produce a space in which there was a sort of breaking down of hierarchies and yet we still very much have a signature artist despite a very large workshop. We still seem in many ways to see the master apprentice and um, yeah, how one struggles with that tension. So I can answer from uh, my experiences as co-organizing those events, I think if you would ask some of the participants, it depends also on uh, which semester, which generation mm -hmm. of students they are. But it was it is a challenge, but I think he was very aware of that and everyone was so working against it was very productive. And there's a lot of different ways I'm trying to do this. One was by not having him as the only teacher, mm -hmm. but really having all those different guest lecturers. I didn't want to go into name dropping, but there were so many people who were really great teachers in, on very different levels. And then he became more the moderator of that, trying to connect mm -hmm. the topics to what he thought the questions of the students at that moment might be. So I also enjoyed a lot in the bigger events to see him in this moderating 
role at connecting um, dots <coughs> on our map. And he was also not there for all of it, so we really also tried to have, okay, say someone like Bruno Latour, because we mentioned him before. Of course, they were doing an experiment together, which is already different from having each of them lecture. So they came to do an experiment together, which was reenacting the debate between um, Bergson and Einstein. Long story, but just to say this was already different. They were actually doing a, I would say, artistic experiment together with the whole auditorium. And then we managed to, in this collaboration with the schools, to have a whole afternoon with Bruno Latour on our own, only with the participants. So all of a sudden it was a very informal um, circle, and he was, would really answer all the questions and would explain it again. And it, you could talk to him like you can't when you are at the Centre Pompidou in a big audience. So sometimes you need to have smaller groups to allow for informality, to allow for a more equal conversation pattern. And, and I know, of course, the first one to ask a question would be Eric or me or someone else from the team. But then, you know, slowly, uh, the second round of questions would definitely come from the participants. It, it's just small examples, but uh, yeah. And the other thing was dealing with media and press. Of course, whenever we had journalists reporting, you really had to repeat again and again that it's not about that. The way they wanted to structure their reports were always, can we talk to you, Olafur, and to one of your master students? So to have this collective field been sketched out was sometimes very challenging, but it was also good because it keeps reminding you that you wanted to do that. And the life of space, um, Seminars are a little bit different because they actually come from Ultra's interest or research, and he's the host inviting because he wants this type of production. <laughs> but of course, it's also one example that is visible. You have also been very courteous to, to all of her. I mentioned him quite a lot here. And yes. You could have told a quite different story without mentioning his name. And I think people may know about the, the Institute for Arm Experiment without necessarily associating that with all of her. So you could have said, no, that is a story without him. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's interesting that you say some might know the Institute now without knowing the all of profound or the target because once we operated for a couple of semesters we actually really had uh, inquiries from people who suggested to collaborate with us and they came from not from the art scene so they were clearly sometimes I don't want to say they didn't know who Olafur is but they didn't really know what it meant to work with Olafur because in other fields it's not so relevant right so we really had this type of uh, interaction but for the context here I thought I'm in also invited because of the show being at the Moderna Museum right now, and I thought a lot of the people might have seen the show or they have been to the um, lecture from my colleagues Anna Engberg and Sebastian uh, Beemann, where it was all about the studio. So I, I thought it's good to make this connection. And then on the other hand, in the practical everyday um, programming of inventing how we would live and work at the Institute, everyone would participate in how this would actually happen. And uh, it was nice that Eric's background and my background were so different that a lot of the initial ideas would come from different ends. Nevertheless, it was at Olafur's studio and he was the one who instigated the whole uh, of course, it's nice in the context of the uh, exhibition, but we actually did think about inviting you a long time before we knew about the exhibition. Even better. <laughs> Thank you very much. What's going on now? Sorry? What's going on now? Uh, what's going on now? Um, I call it uh, the post production at the moment because. Um, from the um, collaboration with the other school, um, I managed to get an extra grant from the uh, Bundeskulturstiftung in Germany, which had just uh, started a, a program for collaboration between German cultural institutions learning from African 
institutions or artists, so we managed to get third middle, uh, third uh, party funding to continue the collaboration with others. So I've actually done a lot of uh, things there, which one of the things resulted in a CD and a film about a, a poetry sound collaboration we did in Amharic, English, German with musicians, poets, performers from all three cultural backgrounds. We had a lot to do with translating, but also translating from one medium to the next. So this is actually uh, a CD that sh uh, features a performance night that we did together and then the film follows couple of those performance nights and workshops. And then the other thing that resulted in the context of this collaboration was that all the co-produced events went into our uh, website archive, audiovisual materials like videos and, and things. But in Addis Abeba the internet is still very slow and bad and they will try or they do try to get the technique from China, and you can see there's a lot of surveillance issues going on there as well, so not everything is accessible, etc, etc. So we made a handbook, a guide through the archive in German, English and Amharic, uh, which is this, and then um, brought the whole content on a, on a computer, like on a, not analog, but not internet-based, uh, what we call media container to the art school there. So these are two of the projects that continue afterwards and now we're trying to see how can you activate an archive the resources that are in the archive with all the networks and all the very great and inspiring people who came through those five years. How can we find a next format of working with this? So there's some ideas up in the air and we'll have to see which one can be realized. One is one idea is to test an online education system where we could connect different places that we visited or different contexts that we experienced, like Addis Abeba or artists in China with Berlin or Zurich or Stockholm or any other place and see what we can learn from that through an online teaching format that of course has to have actual components in each of the places, but it depends on time and funding if this or when this will be. That's just one, one future opportunity. Okay, well, I think we say thank you and good evening and let's continue the conversation in the bar, which is open tonight. And thank you again to Christina. Thank you.